أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي The topic I was asked to address is a topic that is very much talked about in many circles, understanding the Sharia and before that defending religious freedom. For us tonight, I will switch it around a little that in order to defend our religious freedom, we need to explain what is our Sharia so we know what it is we are going to be defending. And whether we defend it or not, Allah Almighty, the one who has sent his deen, his way of life, his Sharia and earth, is the best to defend it. And we are just trying our best from a human perspective to participate in returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tell him, Ya Allah, I tried. But in fact, Allah is the one who will protect it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will guard it from corruption and would guard it from destruction. And so my dear brothers and sisters, we discussed this topic and particularly in our Islamic environment because we ourselves do need clarification, we do need reminders, we do need to make sure we are all on the same page when this word is being used. We also discuss this topic because of its recent emergence in the media, in the political arena, where politicians are made to believe that Sharia is about to reign over the United States of America, causing, as they say, destruction of the national existence of the United States, or a some charge destroying Western civilization from within. And so we have seen that almost in two dozen states, people are going to the ballot and choosing whether they want the Constitution of the United States of America or the Sharia. There are a few guidelines that we as Muslims have to take when we approach this subject. Because first of all, no matter how much convincing argument we can give, we do not we will not be able to change how people feel about Sharia. We might convince them and maybe change how they think, but how they feel, we would not be able to change just by words. We need a lot more than words, a lot more from ourselves in terms of action and exemplifying the Sharia so that they can also change their feelings about what the Sharia is. So words alone is not enough for us to just stand up and say this is what Sharia is and it is not going to be backed up by our own work actions as well. Secondly, in this process there is a big caution that we cannot under any circumstance ridicule anybody's religion. It is not in the nature of Islamic Sharia, the way they talk about Sharia, whether at a political level or whether in the media or whether by other religious groups that we can in return retaliate in that kind of derogatory way of explaining or exposing somebody else's faith. So we have to make sure we have our adab. Yes, we do give examples in others' faith, but we do not do that as mean of ridicule. We do that as mean of comparing what others say on a particular issue. 
The third important thing about discussing this issue about Sharia is that this seems to be somebody else's agenda dumped upon us to keep us busy, to make sure that we are always busy with some issue amongst ourselves, that yesterday it was a lot of other issues. It was the niqab, it was uh, maybe it was uh, charity, it was some other issue yesterday. Today it is going to be Sharia, and as fast as we finish with the Sharia, it's going to be another issue. So in that way, they keep us busy with their agenda. And not to mention that in the process of following somebody else's agenda, our Muslim has the tendency to uh, form a lot of disagreement, and disagreement also turn into division because we can debate, literally open a debate, what is Sharia and what is not Sharia, and you will have 10 groups of people whose definition are we going to take? Are we going to take the professors at Yale and Harvard and and uh, Oxford, are we going to take that definition of Sharia? Are we going to take the Sharia of the ulama of the past or contemporary scholars? Are we going to take the Sharia definition by the progressive Muslims, by the liberal Muslims? Or by whose definition are we? So we can run a whole year, 52 weeks, on what Sharia is and what Sharia isn't, and we will be back to square one. So we also have to be careful of that uh, a trap, so to speak. And so if we look at Sharia, and here this is a very uh, wide understanding of Sharia, before we begin to define it, we need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is the source of truth. He alone determines what is right, and He alone determines what is wrong, as He alone is the creator of human being and everything that exists. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate lawgiver. This he has communicated through his messengers and prophets, through revealed scriptures, and those are referred to as the Sharia. And so therefore, Sharia is the embodiment of all the laws and directives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has directed to humanity in the Quran are given to us by his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam through his sayings and actions and there is no difference whether these regulations pertain to belief to deeds amal or character akhlaq and so with this definition that everything that pertains to our life whether it is our belief system whether it is our actions rituals or human relations or whether it is our overall character all of that constitute what the Sharia is. And so with this broad definition comes two basic uh, aspects or parts of the Sharia. That there is a divine aspect, and that divine aspect is a set of unchanging beliefs and principles that organize life in accordance to Allah's will. It is considered to be a timeless manifestation of the will of God. From the human perspective, Sharia will be man's willingness to carry out the Sharia to the best of his abilities in his given circumstance without creating chaos in society. And so every aspect of the Sharia leads man to recognize the oneness of Allah, to surrender to him alone, to worship him alone, and to invite others to him alone. At the same time, it recognizes all forms of evil, to shun them, to help eradicate them for the betterment of society as a whole. And so with these three major categorization, Iman, which talks about the umur ghaibiyya, metaphysical realities, the essence of Allah, the being of Allah, his messengers, his book, and those who violate Allah, all of these are in that realm. And the amal, which is Ibadat and Mu'amalat, Mu'amalat such as our laws of inheritance, our contract, marriage procedures, divorce, child care, food and drink, punishments, politics, warfare and peace, banking, and a long list of human interaction that we have are all part and parcel of the Sharia. And the third part, which is our akhlaq, our behavior, qualities like honesty, integrity, 
keeping our promises, courage, truthfulness, kindness, humility, good conduct, and all the good deeds that we are supposed to act upon them and encourage society to develop these noble qualities. At the same time, the, the base qualities we are supposed to avoid, like lying, deception, breach of promise, uh, stinginess, arrogance, envy, pride, all of these are things we are supposed to uh, help eradicate in society so that society can function and work in a very coherent and very peaceful manner, hence peace and justice. Somehow, Sharia is being misconstrued with penal laws. And penal laws make up 0.24% of what Sharia really is. If you look in the Quran, there are only about 15 verses out of 6,236 verses of the Quran, only 15 verses talk about hudud or capital punishment, the kind of misunderstanding that is brought upon Western countries that Sharia means to cut off someone's head. And so you find that if you're taking the 15 out of 6,236 verses, you get a quarter of a percent. And this is what turns into the big hole as they throw into the society. This is what Sharia is. Not forgetting that whenever you have to carry out capital punishment, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us about Ta'afaw al-Hudud fi ma baynakum fa ma balagani min al-had faqad wajab. Try to pardon each other before you come with your case to me. If it comes to me, then I have to carry out that punishment. Idra'ul hududa bi shubahat. Prophet said, do not carry out a capital punishment if there is any shade of doubt. And Allah says, walakum fil qisasi hayatun ya ulil albab. There is another life involved when you have to carry out another capital punishment. And as our dear brother Khalid mentioned about cases where people are just put to death for no reason other than because of their color or because of their religion or because of some other factor other than a crime that they have been uh, placed upon them. And so we find, my dear brothers and sisters, that this Sharia, with this kind of misunderstanding, of hands cutting off, adulteress being stoned, and women being oppressed. This is often the picture that is equated with Sharia, a bearded man with a sword in his hand. And while punishment is an integral part in any society, including our society here, because if we look back at last year, we find that 35 or 36 people have been executed, either by lethal injection, by the electric chair, or by firing squad. So why, if that is being filmed and thrown to the world and said this is how death penalty is done here, as opposed to some person in Afghanistan or Pakistan or some other place, do the same thing. You see, if we want to be just, we have to bring both sides and put both things in front. It is not that one society is doing this and the other society is doing afu or pardon on each other. No, there is death penalty right now here in the United States as well. So why make Sharia look like death penalty? Secondly, if we are going to be taking out verses of the Quran in isolation and start telling the American people this is what Sharia is, well, the same kind of scripturalism we can take for the Bible and we can take from the Old Testament, we can take from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 to 21, and talk about how in Judaism, you're supposed to stone your son to death if he disobeys you in the eyes of the public. We can go to, to Luke chapter 19, verse 27, and say Jesus ordered, as he said, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. So we can take out these passages just like that and start to give a body to it and say, is this 
Christianity is? Is this what Judaism is? And he would say, oh, no, 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 this is, it's not that. So why do you take from our scriptures, for why lo lil musallin, woe unto those who pray, without going what says before and what says after, thinking as if prayer is death penalty as well too. So this is how scripturalism is used to defame the Islamic Sharia. And we can go, subhanAllah, this is a time that we live in that no information is secret to anybody. As Brother Khalid said, everything we say is, is open information for the world to see. In India, there is a ritual called sati. And sati is to burn a woman alive while her dead husband is being put on the pyre and put to light to, 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 to burn him. So while he is dead and he is put into that fire, she is thrown alive. It is only when Indira Gandhi came, then she started to make a big noise and Sati was outlawed even up until today. It is still practiced in some of these remote places in, 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 in India. Yesterday and day before yesterday, if you look at CNN news, it says in America, one out of four women has been physically abused in the United States of America. Yesterday, it says one out of three. I thought one out of four was really a lot. But then yesterday, it says one out of three women in the United States of America is being abused. We are not going to be talking about the 8 million, 80 million unwanted pregnancies. We are not going to be talking about the 20 million unsafe ab or abortions that take place. We are not going to be talking about these statistics that are there. You talk about abuse of women in the world. This is world statistics about abuse of women. All of these which the Ish Islamic Sharia would have condemned from the beginning to the end and saving 80 million children and 100 million women that are being abused. And so my dear brothers and sisters, we see that whenever a crime is done against Islam, it is almost always that this person is acting alone and he's insane. As they say, he's, he's paranoid. He suffers from paranoid schizophrenia. But when the same paranoid schizophrenic is a Muslim, suddenly he acts on behalf of the 1.6 billion Muslims, and we all have to face the wrath of the media and the public that this is what Islamic Sharia is. Somehow, no Muslim suffers from paranoid schizophrenia. I, the words are kind of little difficult even to, to say. How evil is that kind of, of um, judgment that they make? We also look, and I'm, I'm concluding, Brother, uh, you know, RF5. I, I don't mind overstep your five minutes, but sometimes when you come from Chicago, five minutes has some baraka. <laughs> the, the other thing about our Islamic, our freedom, and understand uh, defending Islamic freedom is that when we look at previous nations, Allah has given them a Sharia. Allah says, to each we prescribe a law, a Sharia, and a method. And so Qatada uh, radiallahu an, he said, the Bible, there is a Sharia. The Injil, the, the Torah is a Sharia. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, Moses has his Sharia, Jesus has his Sharia, and so our Sharia is also given to us, and Allah tests us with this Sharia. Up until today, the Christians can very easily and comfortably practice their Sharia called the Canon Laws or the Qanun. Judaism still have their form of Sharia called the Halakha, and they have established in very many parts of the major cities in the world a place called Beth Din. And Beth Din is basically to make sure that the Jewish law of divorce and child care and, and all the things that go with it is taken care by the Judaic laws. So while that is going on, and the same thing Muslim is asking, can we not have a court where the divorce, marriage, divorce, alimony, and everything is done according to Islamic law? No, this is coming to destroy America. And basically, it is the same rights or even more rights are going to be given to women if Sharia is going to be practiced in, in matters of family law and divorce and so on. And so, we find that this right to worship 
is something that is guaranteed in the First Amendment of the Constitution. And it says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. This is what is enshrined in the very constitution of our country. And so we look at Sharia not as an outside alien thought, but rather something that goes hand in glove with the very constitution of the United States of America. We look at the United States of America and the framers of this constitution, and one of the framers is John Adams. And John Adams have said that this is Sharia is going to bring destruction. As a matter of fact, Sharia will help to take humanity out of that destruction. May Allah help us to understand and help us to keep the Sharia alive so that society can be a better place for all of us. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum.